Mummies Alive, 1997, Cartoon Explored. The no longer existing DIC Entertainment Corporation, or DEEK, is still well remembered for producing treasured classics like the 1985 French-American animated TV series, Mask, and everybody's favorite, Dennis the Menace, amongst a flock of other animated series. However, in today's video, we'll be talking about the animation studio's 1997 short-lived series titled Mummies Alive, one that was originally intended for older audiences. Of course, the content was lightened for children, but there was no denying that it did maintain a strong emphasis both drama-wise and depth-wise. Written by Eric and Julia Laywald along with Mark Edens, the narrative was a modern-day young boy working together with time-displaced mummy warriors to battle the evil source or Scarab. Needless to say, there is a lot more to the story and the series ended pumping out 42 exciting episodes. This brings us back to today's video, where we will be exploring the cartoon in detail, its best episodes, and some very interesting facts that we are pretty sure that you have no idea about. Are you ready? Well, let's do this. But before we go into explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a very small click for you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Now, let's begin. What is Mummies Alive, 1997, cartoon television series all about? We have decided to do an in-depth explanation of the first three episodes for you to have a fair idea of the cartoon series. The series brags an opening theme song, which is an absolute banger, and the chorus in it happens to be totally awesome. The first episode itself sets the mood and you find yourself having your expectations set pretty high, titled Ra 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 Ra. It begins with Harris Stone arriving at an ancient tomb in Egypt. He is warned by the local guide not to open the tomb, as there happens to be a seal on it, but Stone is determined to open it. As he takes a closer look, he reads out a warning inscribed, but before he can finish reading, the door flings open. Although he is warned by the others not to go inside, he ventures anyways, but is disappointed to find that the 3500 year old crypt to be empty. Further, he finds the walls inscribed with harsh markings instead of hieroglyphics, as if someone inside had been counting days. An evil looking being appears from behind, and Stone is heard screaming. We are not sure what exactly happens to him. The next scene brings us to modern day San Francisco, where a young boy named Presley Carnovan is seen skateboarding around town along with his friend Walter. He stops at a local museum, one where his mother works. Finding Amanda busy on the phone with an upcutting rapesies exhibit, Presley takes money from her bag and heads to the museum cafeteria to grab a snack. A strange voice echoes behind him, and Presley initially thinks it is his friend Walter who is playing some kind of trick on him. Upon hearing the voice again, he starts following the sound through the new rapesies exhibit and walks by a shabti, lining on either side of the hall, disregarding them as regular statues. The room that he enters looks just like a tomb. There are various Egyptian hieroglyphics, artifacts, statues, as well as sarcophagi all over. With the voice speaking to him again, and this time saying, Goodbye, my son, Presley gets annoyed and freaked both at the same time, and decides to get out of there only to trip over the sarcophagus of Prince Rapesy's pet cat. He gets a bit emotional in spite of the fact that he actually hates cats, and realizes things are getting a bit weird. He begins to emit a strange glow, and unbeknownst to Presley, he is actually being watched by a certain someone. Anyway, the boy starts leaving the room, but before he can do that, a Shabti comes to life and attacks him. Presley is absolutely horrified and runs to a security guard asking for his help, only to realize that he too is a Shabti and goes back inside. Not knowing what to do, he decides to hide himself amongst an empty sarcophagus. Without warning, he is pulled out by someone who addresses him as Prince and himself as an old pal, Scarab. Presley continues to struggle to set himself free from his grip. Scarab tells him how the former's father entombed him for 3,500 years. Of course, this comes as a total shock to Presley, and he can neither make the head or tail of his story. While this conversation is going on, four sarcophagi at the back are seen to get open without the duo's knowledge, and with Presley crying out for help, four extremely bright beams of light, each emitting from the sarcophagus, knocks both Presley and Scarab down. When the light subsides, four mummies are seen standing in its place. Suddenly, the quartet is heard shouting, With the strength of Ra! and each of them is seen resorting to the power of an Egyptian god and armoring themselves up. The transformation is indeed magnificent, and what follows next is an intense battle. On witnessing his army get easily defeated by the mummies, Scarab transforms too. His body gets covered by a gold and purple-hued armor, and it is fair to say that his transformation makes him look a lot like a scarab beetle. Possessing the ability to fly, Scarab grabs Presley and blasts a hole up in the ceiling with the sole purpose of escaping with the boy, only to get stopped by one of the mummies called Jack Cal. Scarab vows to come back and is seen to fly away. Presley posts realizing that the mummies are good guys suggests to them that they should all get out of there before someone arrives and sees the messed up place. With the help of Kati, the scared cat, the group makes their way out of the ceiling opening minutes before the police arrive. 
The armored mummies are seen reverting back to their regular mummy selves, much to the surprise of Presley, who inevitably asks them how they do it. The mummies call it magic, the magic which gives them their strength, but it is limited and when it wanes, they have to rest in their sarcophagi to renew it. Presley decides to take them to his house for the time being, and soon learns of his true identity. He is the reincarnated version of Prince Rapses, the only son of the pharaoh Amenhotep. Of course, he doesn't believe them and tells them that he has never even been to Egypt. The leader of the mummies introduces himself as Jakal, and the rest is Amon, Wrath, and Nefer. It takes Presley only a split second to figure out that Nefer is in reality a girl and points that out. This comes as a major blow to the rest and Nefer introduces herself as Nefer Atina. She has been pretending to be a man all this while because women back then weren't allowed to drive the chariots of the pharaoh. She further adds that Prince Rapses knew about it even back then. Back at the museum, Harris Stone is seen to arrive. He is not only one of the major benefactors for the museum, but also the identity Scarab has taken over back since the real Harris Stone had discovered his crypt. Stone informs the museum curator, Mr. Heppelwhite, along with Amanda, that considering the safety of the treasures of Rapses, he will be sending the entire exhibit back to Egypt that very night. Amanda protests and tells him that the exhibit has just opened, to which Stone says that it is he who is paying for the exhibit. He further hands over a check of $10 million to take care of the obligations. Later, with Amanda coming home, Presley learns that the whole exhibit being shipped back to Egypt that night and informs the mummies. Presley comes back to the museum along with the mummies to see the sarcophagi being loaded into a truck. The mummies tell him that they cannot return to Egypt as their job to stay there and protect him. Jack Cal tells Presley that the sarcophagus of Rapsius was brought here with the sole purpose of luring him into the open. With the mummies realizing that they need their sarcophagi in order to recharge their magic, they decide to stop the truck. With Nefertina addressing Mr. Heppelwhite's car outside as a horse's chariot, Rath activates the car using a spell and no points for guessing who takes the wheel. Inspired by the tiny people she has been seeing, driving horses' chariots in the spirit box, she drives the car terribly, if we may add, and almost hits a child only to use her whip lash in the last minute and turn around the car somehow. The group eventually catches up with the truck and Nefertina hands over the wheels to Presley, before climbing up on the moving truck. The rest of the mummies climb aboard too and enter the truck from above to recharge themselves. However, the truck gets stopped by Shaptis dressed up as police officers and they easily overpower the drivers. Scarab arrives too, transformed, and orders his army to destroy the truck and everything in it. Presley attempts to stop them only to get surrounded by Scarab and his army. But by then, the mummies have easily managed to recharge themselves and now they even have a new punchline. Let's kick Tut. For those who do not get the reference, and we highly doubt if there's any, Tut rhymes with but, so now you know. Anyway, there's another fierce battle between the mummies and the scarab along with his army. While the army is hell-bent on destroying the truck for obvious reasons, Nefertina takes on the wheels yet again with the rest of the mummies landing on the roof. The fight seems to have moved up on the roof as well. There comes a point where Presley is literally thrown off the truck and hangs by the window. He would have gotten hit by a street sign had Jakal not pulled him up for safety on the truck rooftop. However, Scarab appears and blasts at Jakal, knocking him down only to knock himself down when the truck passes under a low-hanging overpass. Scarab promises to destroy the mummies even if it meant shattering the world. As for the mummies, they drop Presley back at his home. With Presley asking them where they will go, they tell him that it is their responsibility to take care of them and that they will be close by. The second episode, titled Sleepwalk Like an Egyptian, begins with Presley using the Eye of Ra amulet and getting access inside the museum. Raph tells him that it's the only thing that stands between him and Scarab and that he has charged the amulet with special energies found in a scroll that the pharaoh left for them. The amulet is what keeps Presley blurred from Scarab's sight and at the same time helps the mummies keep an eye on him. Speaking of Scarab, of course, he is unable to trace the boy, no with his magical speaking snake Cumstaff passing sarcastic remarks at him and calling this situation a living nightmare, an evil idea crosses through his mind. Scarab spits out a living nightmare scorpion and further sends the shadow to deliver the living nightmare to the boy. The scorpion stings him and Presley falls into what seems to be like an entranced state. He seems to be daydreaming about how his spirit's past life came to be. So in this dreamlike state, he is Prince Rapses and sees everybody starting from his mother, Scarab, and each of the mummies in their previous lives. The events in his dream seem to be taking place 3500 years ago. We learn that Scarab was the pharaoh's most trusted advisor, and even back then, Rapses wasn't really a fan of him. As we further move ahead in the events of the episode, we also learn that Rapsis eats conversation with Nefertina. The fact that he knew she was a girl and was just pretending to be a boy since it was against the law for girls to drive chariots. Next, he is seen learning his lessons from his tutor, one who happens to be none other than Wrath. 
With Raph teaching him how to transform a staff into a snake, Presley ends up repeating a magical chant that eventually turns his teacher's pointer stick into a real snake. Armand's lessons of combat helps Presley flip a school student calling it a jitsu. Later with Jacal asking Rapsis if he would like to test his skills as a hunter, the latter is euphoric and decides to join him after changing his clothes. However, on the way to his room, he meets Scarab, who tells him that his father wishes to meet him in secret and that he's waiting for him in the desert. Apparently, there's some conspiracy going on in the palace, and that's the sole reason that his father wishes to talk to him somewhere else in private. The dream sequence also gives us a glimpse of Jakal's wife Tia and their newborn son Paget. Eventually, the viewers along with Presley are drawn to a scene where Scarab has brought the young prince under the pretense of making him meet his father. Presley, on the other hand, is simultaneously drawn to the rooftop of an abandoned building that has Scarab impatiently waiting for him. As for the mummies, they are also able to figure out that something is wrong, and with Presley not having returned from school yet, they take up the Save the Sphinx signboards and march along with other protesters while looking for Presley. In his dream state, Presley finally arrives at the scene that shows Rapsis reaching on top of a mountain and calling out to his father only to realize that it was just his father's illusion created by the evil sorcerer Scrap, who reveals his true intentions. Thank goodness for the mummies, who managed to arrive on the rooftop just before Scarab is about to remove Rapsi's soul from the still in trance Presley. With Scarab calling out his army of Shabti to deal with the mummies, the quartet is seen to transform and no points for guessing the epic battle which follows. Presley is also seen to finally wake up from his dreamlike state and is able to put the pieces together. Scarab is seen to transform too and knocks Jakal down, telling him that after he is done with the boy, he will anyway not have need for any guardians. As a Shabti is about to grab Presley, Armand picks it up and hurls it at Scarab. This gives Jakal enough time to come back to his group and protect Presley. As an infuriated Scarab orders his army to crush them and push them over the edge of the roof, but Presley kicks a water tower which collapses on the roof itself. The result of this happens to be all the Shabti getting washed away by the force of the water, which also includes Scarab, and he is seen falling down from the roof. A news report later states the mayor's declaration that the Sphinx will not be demolished for the time being. Wrath and Armand, who are seen watching the news, are pretty surprised to find themselves both on TV and inside the Sphinx too at the same time. Wrath finds the whole thing too complicated to explain. Presley is later seen asking Jakal if the dream that he saw was real. The latter tells him that it was and they couldn't save him. When he takes the blame on him, Presley asks him about his family, to which Jakal replies that he does not know what happened to them. The episode ends with Presley promising Jakal to make it up to him someday. The third episode titled, Pack to the Future, begins with a flashback, one that has Amenhotep entombing Scarab alive after the latter took his son's life. The next scene brings the viewers back to the present times and shows Scarab waking up screaming. Clearly he has been having those nightmares, and he is thinking of all the possible ways to lay his hands on the boy. Speaking of Presley, he is seen telling the mummies about his camping trip to Yosemite with his mom. He forbids his protectors from following him and tells them that if Scarab plans any kind of attack on him, he would simply call for help using the amulet. Of course, this makes the mummies super anxious, and they end up sending Kati to Presley's camping trip without him knowing anything. They also make the sacred cat wear the Eye of Horus so as to keep track of everything. Scarab, on the other hand, uses a spell and summons the Trackers of Souls from the western gate to track down Presley. The group initially consists of Set, Anubis, Wolf Deity, and Bull Deity, but they are soon joined by another mythological creature, Amut, who decides to tag along with them. Picking up on Presley's scent, the pack is seen eventually reaching the camping site. As for Presley, he suddenly finds Kati inside the sleeping tent and goes outside leaving his amulet behind. Thinking the mummies have followed him there, he calls out, but gets surrounded by the trackers of Sol instead. Meanwhile, Wrath is able to figure out the route to Yosemite, and mummies decide to drive down via their mummy mobile to the camping site. The pack attempts to trap Presley, who managed to escape them by a whisker, only to fall into a river and swim towards a waterfall. He is just about to fall into the waterfall when Kati ends up saving him. As the duo start running to get out of the woods, they reach a dead end. The pack has also caught up with them by then. Suddenly, Katty is seen to transform into a bigger and more powerful Link-sized cat so as to protect Presley, but it doesn't really help because by then a transformed Scarab along with his armory of Shapti has also reached the venue. Scarab shoots a blast at Katty and nearly knocks the cat off the cliff, but Presley is able to pull her up after she transforms back to her usual self. But just when you think Presley is about to meet his end at the hands of Scarab, his protectors are seen to arrive. Presley jumps into the car along with Katty, but with Scarab firing another 
laser beam at the car. The mummies get out and transform themselves into their armor. No points for guessing. It's another intense battle and the mummies are successful in defeating the pack and even sending them back through the western gate, except for Amut, who is seen to run away. As for Scarab, he is seen to fly away too. Jakal tells Presley never to venture so far again and that he must stay by his side so that he can watch over him like a father watches over a son. Clearly, Presley doesn't mind that and upon reaching his camp, he is seen falling dead on his camp bed at the same time Amanda is seen to wake up. The episode ends with Amut having followed Scarab back to his den and the latter finally realizing that it is the eclipse that will be at the end of the boy and the beginnings of his immortality. Cartoon main characters and cast Presley Carnovan. Our central character here is a 12 year old boy living in San Francisco with his mother. He is the reincarnated version of Prince Rapses, the heir to the Egyptian throne some 3500 years back. However, the young prince was killed by the wicked sorcerer Scarab, who wanted to become immortal. Coming back to the storyline of the cartoon series, Presley learns that his real identity when the mummies end up saving him from the wrath of Scarab in the very first episode and introduce themselves as his protective guardians. Presley, in most cases, is usually seen to be both unwilling and hesitant towards accepting his role as Prince Rapses, except for two particular incidents, which certainly deserve a mention. The first one is when Amenhotep makes an appearance through the Western Gate, and the second instance is when the original Rapses gets drawn into the present world. Both times, Presley is seen displaying a complete lack of enthusiasm at losing his standing as the Pharaoh, because to be very honest, it would have led him to losing his friends, the mummies too, and his bond with them is shown to get deeper and deeper with each episode. The character is voiced by Bill Switzer, who, by the way, is also quite famous for portraying the character of Harvey Kinkle in Sabrina the Animated Series and Superhero Cannonball in X-Men Evolution. Scarab Say hello to the primary antagonist for the cartoon series, who was once the most trusted royal advisor of the Pharaoh. But Scarab had his wicked intentions. He craved a position even higher than the one he was given and soon devised a plan to use magic in order to retain his youth as well as rule Egypt as a pharaoh. The only thing that stood in his way as a prickly thorn was Amenhotep's son, Prince Rapses, and Scarab realized that he had to get the young prince out of his way to execute his plans. Under the pretense of making him meet his father, Scarab was effectively able to lure the young prince to a secluded place away from his protective guardians and suck the life force from Rapses in order to say young and immortal. The Guardians could not save Rapses and in process lost their lives at the hand of the evil sorcerer. His crimes were eventually discovered by the pharaoh who had him entombed alive as an act of punishment. Amenhotep had even put a seal on his tomb stating whoever opened it would be cursed. After a few centuries, Scarab's effects started wearing off and he had began to grow old inside his crypt. With Harrowstone discovering and opening his tomb in the year 1928, Scarab attacks him and takes over his identity. Over the years, Scarab as Stone has become a wealthy millionaire and post discovery the Prince Rapses was reincarnated as Presley Carnovan, he makes up his mind to steal his spirit yet again. Making use of the money and knowledge that he has acquired over the years, Scarab is seen going to great extents to capture Presley and terminate the mummies. He is also capable of transforming himself into what looks a lot similar to a scarab beetle and he is shown to flaunt a gold and purple armor that gives him the ability to fly as well as fire laser beams at his enemies. As a highly skilled sorcerer, he is capable of summoning various mythological creatures and also has an army of Shabti at his service. Please note that he also has quite a good hold over modern technology and in case we missed out, he actually has a magical speaking snake cum staff named Heka who actually has an ability to spit fire. The character is voiced by Gerald Plunkett. Jack Cal. The pharaoh's royal hunter became the leader of the mummies and is seen transforming using the spirit of a falcon. His armor allows him to fly and his main weapons happen to be his exceedingly sharp claws and a bow capable of shooting flaming arrows. He is extremely protective of Presley Carnovan and is usually seen acting as a father figure to him. In fact, it is mostly Jackal who is seen standing between Presley's safety and his death in the hands of the evil sorcerer. He is the sole reason Scarab's sinister plans have always failed. It is the second episode of the series that gives us a glimpse of his wife Tia and their newborn son. Padgett, and it is a pity that he dies not knowing what happened to his family. For someone who will always put the need of others before him, Jakal will choose to sacrifice himself without the slightest bit of hesitation if it comes to saving others. But having said that, he is also quite sharp-minded and will always think of the best possible way to defeat his enemies. The cartoon series also takes a pretty interesting turn when Jakal's older evil brother, Arak, is finally revealed. The character is voiced by the Canadian voice actor, Dale Wilson, who is also famous for lending his voice to characters Captain Gridiron. Iron, Mutt, Overkill, and Skydive in G.I. Joe, a real American hero. 
Wrath. As the pharaoh's chief scribe and sorcerer, Wrath is the wittiest amongst all the mummies, known for his spellcasting abilities and often regards himself as a know-it-all. While it is true that not much is known in particular about his past life, we do know that he was assigned by the pharaoh to teach Rhapsies all about ancient Egyptian magic. One of his former students, Chantra, also deserves a special mention here. Wrath was both proud and fond of Chantra, but with the former dedicating most of his time to Rhapsies after the pharaoh asked him to be the young prince's tutor, Chantra felt betrayed. Wrath was forced to end his relationship with Chantra, which obviously infuriated the latter, and she promised to take his vengeance on him from walking away from her. Coming back to the storyline of Wrath, he was mummified along with the other guardians after being killed in a battle against Scarab's forces, only to reawaken years later to safeguard the modern-day reincarnation of Prince Rapses in San Francisco. Wrath is seen using the spirit of a snake when he transforms, and it is a golden cobra that wraps around him and serves as his armor. His primary weapon happens to be a sword that can, you guessed it, change itself into a snake. As mentioned before, Wrath is the only one among the mummies to be able to use magical spells, being in possession of a horde of ancient scrolls. He has also been successful in learning to blend ancient Egyptian magic with modern day technology and has his engineering skills on display while building the Hot Ra. His character is voiced by the celebrated Scott McNeil, who has also lent his voices for the character Set and Bob in the cartoon series. Besides Mummies Alive, he is notable for his work in Dragon Ball Z, Beast Wars Transformers, X-Men Evolution, Inuyasha, and Full Metal Alchemist, amongst others. Armon as a warrior in the pharaoh's royal army, Armon had lost his right arm while fighting one of his battles. The pharaoh had given him a magical golden arm that he could use as a substitute. Armon was even assigned as the young prince's bodyguard as well as his Egyptian Sioux trainer. After his death in the battle against Scarab's forces, the pharaoh mummified him along with the other guardians and he reawakened years later with the sole goal of protecting the reincarnated son of the pharaoh. Armon is seen using the spirit of a ram to transform and his primary weapon happens to be his golden arm that he can use both as a drill as well as a propeller. Conclusively, the strongest amongst the mummies, he is powerful even when he isn't beefed up with his armor. It's fair to address him as a gentle giant, one that loves to eat and spend time watching things on the magic box, aka the television. While he isn't really the sharpest in the group, he does like to punch his way through a problem, something that usually works out in his favor. He is voiced by Graham Kingston. Nefertina. Okay, first things first, she is the only female member of the mummies, something that came as a shock to the trio of Jackal, Wrath, and Armand when Presley pointed that out. A little bit of digging leads us to her childhood, where we learn that she was the only child and her father always wanted a son in the first place, so it's quite obvious that he was never really proud of her. Nefertina, on the other hand, wanted to prove that she was capable of doing all the things that a man does, so she ended up disguising herself as a man, wearing a headpiece, and started driving chariots and addressing herself as Nefer. After she won the Nile Valley Championship, she became the pharaoh's chariot driver, and the fact that she was brilliant at it made the pharaoh choose her to be one of the prince's protectors. Well, it was the prince who knew about Nefertina's secret identity and using that as leverage, he made her teach him how to drive a chariot. Cut to the present, she is seen reawakening along with the other guardian protectors and like the rest, swearing to defend Presley. Nefertina is seen using the spirit of a cat to transform and the armor gives her sharp claws which can easily cut through anything. Her primary weapon happens to be a whip, one that she is quite efficient with. As someone who is free spirited, Nefertina is more than willing to try anything that's new. She eventually becomes quite proficient driving the hot rod too. At the end of the day, she boots a very strong soul, one that can always make her do what is right for her friends. Her character is voiced by Cree Summer, who is quite famous for lending her voice in popular shows such as Inspector Gadget, Sonic the Hedgehog, Gargoyles, Superman the Animated Series, The Incredible Hulk, Thundercats, Rick and Morty, Avengers Assemble, and Teen Titans Go, amongst many more. What went wrong with the cartoon? Well, it is a known thing that Eric and Julia Leowal, the writers as well as producers of Mummies Alive, were also the head writers of the third season of the popular Gargoyle series. So to those who have seen both the animated series will clearly be able to figure out that the 1997 cartoon shared a hell lot of similarities in terms of the plot elements. So, there are these warriors from the past awakening in the present, similar mission, an immortality obsessed enemy, the initial hitches in getting used to modern world, the various usage of mythological creatures, these are just a few basic instances, and no way can these be coincidences. Of course, these made Mummy's life look like a clone of Gargoyles. Best Episodes Not To Miss Here's the list of our top 10 favorite episodes ranked in order. Please make sure that you don't miss them, and if you happen to have a different list, do not hesitate to share them with us in the comment section below. Pack to the Future, Episode 3 The Gift of Geb, Episode 4 Desert Sheik, Episode 5 
Body Slam, Episode 9, The Face in the Mirror, Episode 16, Sleep Walk Like an Egyptian, Episode 2, Pause, Episode 10, Dead Man Walking, Episode 7, The Curse of Sekhmet, Episode 11, Family Feud Part 1, Brothers Keeper, Episode 38. Interesting facts about the cartoon. Well, to begin with, if you take a closer look at the name of the central characters here, Presley Carnavent, both the names share some great references. The first is obviously Elvis Presley and his well-known abode in Memphis, Tennessee, which happens to share the same name with an ancient city in Lower Egypt. The second happens to be George Edward Stanhope Molyneux, Herbert V, Earl of Carnovan, an aristocratic benefactor of the archaeologist Howard Carter. In case you did not know, both are given credits for discovering the tomb of Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings back in the year 1922. Next, in case you are not aware of, the series' voice work was actually done in Canada, one of the main reasons why Mummy's Live is often addressed as a Canadian series. Then there's Shabti, which is often considered to be a work of pure fiction, but in reality, they are actually based on the painted wooden figures of servants and workers who are placed inside the Egyptian tombs to do work for the dead. Lastly, the producers of the show purposely chose 1525 BC as the time period post doing a fair share of research about ancient Egyptian history. There are facts which prove that Pharaoh Amenhotep I reigned from the period 1549 BC to 1526 BC. In the series, Amenhotep is shown to be the father of Prince Rapses, and we all know how the story turned out to be. As for the real events taking place in the life of the pharaoh, his son had also died but during infancy, which points out to the simple fact that Amenhotep actually died without a surviving heir. Does that ring a bell? The Future of Mummies Alive Remember the part where we told you that the cartoon series was initially geared towards an older production, but it was during the time of production that Mummies Alive chiefly became a children's show. So, don't be surprised when we tell you that of course there was a second series which was planned, and if we are not wrong, a total of number of 65 episodes were planned to be produced, out of which only 42 were generated. An interview of Andy Hayward was Hayward himself confirming the original number. The series was eventually cancelled and the blame was given to its low ratings. Deek Entertainment's Mummies Alive was part of a general trend of mummy mania in the 1990s pop culture. Boasting an intriguing premise, a bunch of interesting characters with Power Ranger style armor transformations and an impressive opening theme song with a mind-blowing chorus, the cartoon series was categorically entertaining. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.